sun and CO2 to make glucose, the sugar that they use for food. They also put oxygen into the air so we can share because oxygen is everywhere. If I were to ask you what does the eucalyptus tree, the kangaroo and the blue tongue lizard have in common? And if you were to tell me, well, they actually all live in a similar environment, you would be correct because the extra dot point says identify and describe in detail adaptations of a plant and an animal from the local ecosystem. So all of these are within our local ecosystem, which is Sydney itself. We can find all of these different trees, so sort of plants and animals. And what we'll do in this video is we'll cover some of the adaptations. So it says identify, which means we have to just name the adaptation. It also says this is identify, which means name. But it also says describe, which means we have to give quite a bit of detail as well when it comes to the name. After we've named them, describe them. So we have to describe, I'll describe for the eucalyptus tree, the kangaroo, and the blue tongue lizard. But make sure any, the, any of the adaptations that come up in class, or any of the animals that come in class, make sure to also remember them as well. They're really important. So the ones that are relevant for Sydney are, for example, the eucalyptus tree. And it's got quite a few adaptations. And obviously, if you look at the environment, what does kind of environment does, does the eucalyptus tree, the blue tongue lizard, and the red kangaroo live in? Well, it lives in an environment which is quite dry, so it's usually quite dry. It's quite hot as well, hot and dry, and it's also bushfires. There's lots of bushfires, which can be a problem as well. So these are typical factors that come up when it comes to environment in Sydney. So what kind of adaptations do these different organisms? Remember, organisms are any living thing. What kind of adaptation do these living organisms have to be able to survive in those kind of conditions? So we've got our eucalyptus tree, and here we've got our cute koala eating that eucalyptus tree. And the koala itself is actually munching on the leaf. So you can see the leaves here. You can see they're quite thin. I'm actually just drawing the shape of it. You know, quite thin. And how does it help them survive in a hot and dry environment? Well, if you can imagine these thin different leaves, if you've got the sun actually directing its sunlight on it, because it's quite narrow, it's quite thin, it's not going to be able to warm up as much. So it's, it's going to have less warming up, less warming up, and if there's some water close by on the leaf, there'd be less evaporation. And we call it transpiration when it comes on, on leaf, but less evaporation on leaves. And this helps it to obviously not, not become too hot. And it also makes sure it can conserve some water because there's less evaporation happening. So those two are beneficial factors for the eucalyptus tree. And they happen because they have these thin leaves. If they had broad leaves, like some of the European leaf, uh, plants do, I, mean, I don't know why I draw a pink um, leaf, but yeah, if they had broad leaves, there would be more evaporation and more warming up, which would be bad in a really hot and dry environment. It also has, so this was narrow leaves, you call it adaptation narrow leaves, narrow leaves. It also has something called a thin, waxy cuticle. And this, so what you can imagine here, you've taken this leaf, you've taken this leaf and you've just cut it into two, cut it down the middle, and now you're looking at it from the side. So this is a side view here. So this is the top of the leaf, it's the top, and this is the bottom. And what is this waxy cuticle? Well, wax is a type of fat. And what happens if you have fat? and water close by, if they're close together, you've got fat and water, will they mix? Well, no, they can't mix. So what water can't penetrate fat. So water can't go past fat. And because wax is also a type of fat, what that means is any water inside won't be able to pass that waxy cuticle. So it won't be able to evaporate through the leaf itself. So the, the waxy cuticle, which I wrote here, is another thing that helps it to actually be able to prevent drying out because it traps water inside. Now, it also aligns, it has, these are called vertically, vertically hanging leaves. Hanging leaves. I'll cover why as well. Because vertically hanging, so vertical means just like this, as opposed to horizontal, which is like this. And with that, if you have the sun, what you'll see is the sun usually, because it's hanging from the top, like these ones here, it will warm up this part, but the other part will actually be not exposed. So lower parts of the leaf not be exposed. And the same with the actual, with the narrow leaves. This will just have no warming up and no water loss, which is good because it lives in a dry environment and hot environments. It doesn't want to warm up anymore and it doesn't want to be able to lose more water. And this kind of 
exposure, this vertical hang leaf, make sure that only parts of the plant get exposed as opposed to all of it. So that was another adaptation. If you mentioned what a couple of videos back, we talked about aleopathy. That is a poison that the extra, some of the eucalyptus trees can produce. And that poison kills off all the competition around it. So that's an advantage for an advantage. It's an adaptation, a physiological adaptation to be able to survive because if it kills off all the things around it, it has more space and more water. It also has seeds that germinate after bushfire. And this picture actually here, right here, is eucalyptus trees 15 months after bushfire. So it had a massive bushfire and you can see they're actually starting to grow again. Because their seeds are specialized, they actually need to have a bushfire to be able to grow. And that's beneficial in Australia because there are lots of bushfires. So that was a eucalyptus, that was our plant that we talk about here. And some of the adaptations, we've named them. So that would just be saying the names of them, but we also described them as well. And the next one is the blue tongue lizard. And the blue tongue is also one we can find in Sydney. And what it does, it can seek shade. That's a behavioral adaptation, just seeking shade. And this would, it would do this if it's too warm. So if it's too warm, just like humans, no, you seek the shade to stay out of the actual warmth. But it can also do something called controlled exposure, which means it just shows parts of its body, shows parts of its body. And it's actually exactly what's happening in this picture. You can see here, this here is in the shade and only its head is popping out. So it might actually be warm, but they still want to have some sunlight. So having controlled exposure means that they keep the most of the body in the shade and they still get a bit of sunlight by making sure their head pops out. And also they have sun basking and they do this if it's too cold. So for example, if it's late afternoon and the sun's going down, it's going to be a cold night. So they want to make sure they get as much sun as they can before it gets too cold. And they do sun basking at late during the night, day to make sure that they can survive the night. And also they can curl out the tear, their tail. And that's also another adaptation. So if they can curl their tail up like that, that means it's going to be less exposed for the sunlight. So it's going to be less problems when it comes to sunlight as well and less warming up. So curls its tail out is another adaptation for that as well. So these are four that are for the blue tongue lizard. So we've named them and we've described them. And we've got another one, which is our red kangaroo. Now it can hop around. And hopping is useful for two circumstances. For example, if it's too hot, by it hopping so much, it can make sure it can not have contact with the floor too, for too long. Yeah, the floor would be really hot as well, so it wouldn't want to be on the floor for too long. So by always hopping, it can make sure it just has you know, seconds, milliseconds of being on the actual hot floor, and then get back onto the cold air. And also, if it's so that's if it's too hot, but often it's too cold. Now, why would what happens if you go, for example, for a jog? You know, for would you would you have warmed up after going for a jog? So yeah, usually you become you know, very warm because you've just run. And same thing with them. If they hop around, if it's really cold, they can hop around not to actually cool down, but to warm up because their actual mass activity will allow them to warm up, produces heat. So they can use hopping either when it's too cold or when it's too warm. They can also terminate their pregnancy, and we'll talk about that in a future video. But if the conditions aren't right, so if it's you know, bad weather, so if it's too hot or if there's not enough food, they can actually terminate their pregnancy, which means they wouldn't have to waste their energy on raising a young joey, which then would die from the actual bad conditions. So they can terminate if the conditions aren't right. Also, they can lick their paws. And the reason why is if they lick their paws, that water will actually evaporate, so the spit will evaporate, and that spit will actually then, the evaporation will cool them. So that's not an adaptation for them to be cooled down. That paw, licking with the paw makes sweat, or not sweat, but water on their actual paw. That evaporates, and then the evaporation cools it. And also we said blood vessels can dilate. Dilate means it becomes bigger. And the blood vessels, especially in your arms and your legs and your face, if they become bigger, that means we have more blood going to your arms that can face. And that means you have more heat, which is transferred in your blood, being able to leave the actual blood and go outside into your atmosphere and the environment. So blood vessels is another adaptation for when it's too hot. You have more blood flow to face, which is why, for example, we go red when it's too hot. And that because that means we have got more blood flow at our face, but that also means that we lose more heat, which is good when it's too hot. So these are some of the actual adaptations. So it says identify, and describe. So we've identified, for example, for eucalyptus tree, eucalyptus tree, which is our plant. We've got narrow leaves. We have thin wax cuticle. We've got vertical hanging leaves. We've got leopathy. We've got seeds that germinate after bushfire. 
And then we also described them as well. The blue tongue lizard, we had things like seeking shade, control exposure, sun basking, and curls as tail out. Again, we, we described them as well. And for the red kangaroo, we had things like hopping for when it's too cold or when it's too warm, that they can terminate their pregnancy, that they can lick their paws, and they can make their blood vessels dilate. And then we describe why they were beneficial as well. That's what we have to do. And to make sure any examples that come up in class, make sure you remember them as well. So maybe should you remember the actual adaptation and you can describe it as well. Hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.